Days 1 through 3. I've never left my village before, but now I've arrived in the city of Venice. It's absolutely breathtaking. People say it's a marvel of the world, like the ancient wonders, and even though I've never been more than a few miles from home, I don't have reason to doubt it. The entire city is built on a lagoon, with the very building seeming to float on the water. It's incredible, and I've been told that it's the secret to the city's success. It's all but impossible to lay siege to the floating city. My excitement is overwhelming, and I'm grateful that my best friend Cristoforo made the move with me to the city. With trade in the Far East booming, the docks have been struggling to keep enough workers on hand. Many of the dockhands start their work here and then eventually make their move to one of the big sailing ships, setting out for adventure in the far-flung corners of our world. It's a good way to make money and earn respect, too. Maybe one day I, too, will leave the docks behind. But Cristoforo isn't a fan of big ships, and he's scared of deep water. I make fun of him, teasing him with the fact that we'll be living in a floating city surrounded by water. Our journey is pleasant enough, with good weather, surprisingly mild for summer, and soon enough we're in our new home. Days 4 through 7. We have a friend in the city, Johannes, or else it'd be the flop houses for us. Smelly, dangerous places where criminals and the poorest of citizens stay. I hear that here in Venice, even the flop houses are nicer than anywhere else. And I don't doubt it, the city is beautiful. I'm so excited that it helps to cover up the pain of having to leave my family behind. But I won't be gone forever, just long enough to make good coin and eventually move my family here with me. Until then, they're only a week's journey away by foot. Maybe I'll even earn enough to buy a horse and cut the journey in half. I can't imagine the look on everyone's faces if I return home with my very own horse. Johannes and his beautiful wife Isabella are gracious and wonderful hosts. Johannes has done well for himself, investing in one of the galleys that sails the Asiatic trade routes, and we stay in one of his spare bedrooms. Their two young children, boys that barely reach our waist, are rambunctious and full of life. Cristoforo and I feel a joy sharing their home and it helps cut the sting of missing our own children. We help them out with their chores as much as we can. Isabella senses our homesickness and sweetly goes out of her way to make us special treats and our favorite dishes to dull the pain. Cristoforo and I start working the day after our arrival. The job is hard, loading and unloading ships, but the pay is good. The city is wealthy, making a fortune from trade and even dockhands make good coin here, earning significantly more than any other port in Italy. By the end of our first day, I already have calluses on my hands, but it's worth it. Back home, I'd have been a farmer like my father and his father before him, making just enough to continue living, but with no hope of improving my lot in life. Here, there's opportunity, and I dream of earning enough not just to move my family to the city, but one day attend an art school. Days 8 and 9 there's been disturbing rumors at the docks. People have started falling ill in Genoa and Pisa. They've been breaking out in large boils that ooze a foul-smelling pus. Doctors are incapable of treating them and it's said they die soon after infection. No one seems to know what's causing it and there's concern any time someone has an errant cough. But then everyone laughs and ignores it. The hard work keeps our minds occupied. Days 10 through 12. Two of the foremen at the docks haven't shown up to work, and there's been several workers who have come down with a severe fever. Everyone's very concerned, especially with the rumors coming from Genoa and nearby cities that spread with each arriving ship. An official from the city came to inspect the docks this morning. He kept a rag covering his mouth and nose the entire time. I don't know what his purpose was, but he made many notes and left in a hurry. I'm concerned if they shut down the docks, it'll shut down my only source of income, but I shake those fears away. The very lifeblood of Venice is the sprawling docks. Without the wealth the trade ships bring in, all the fancy schools and institutions the city is world famous for would shut their doors for good. Days 13 through 15. Something is very wrong. At least half of the dock workers have fallen ill, many too sick to continue working. Nobody is allowed to visit any of the affected, and the city's begun moving them to warehouses near the docks. They've even started to post guards outside the warehouses to ensure nobody goes in or comes out. The rumors that will soon be shut down are even stronger, and several more city officials have come to visit, all of them covering their noses and mouths with rags. A young boy of 16 Cristoforo and I befriended has started coughing, but he laughs it off when we express our concern. We can't help but keep our distance from him even though it feels rude to do so, but I'll admit, I'm scared. Days 16 to 20. The docks have been shut down. I can't believe it. One of the most famous ports in the entire world has been brought to a grinding halt. The number of ships anchored offshore grows by the day, each waiting to deliver their cargo. 
I hear that the crews are furious, knowing that each day they sit out at anchor they lose profit. Christopher and I have received a full month's pay despite working only half a month, that is, the benefit of working in one of the richest cities in Europe. But though the pay is fair, it won't last us long if the docks stay shut down. I keep trying to keep Christophero's spirits up, reminding him that Venice is a trade city, it can't survive without it. They'll keep the docks shut down long enough to get on top of the strange new illness and then we'll reopen again. Johannes and Isabella have been very gracious to us despite our temporary loss of work. We both promised to find other jobs in the meantime, but they simply nod and smiled. I admit, being in Johannes' home makes me miss my own less. Watching him with his wife and two young children reminds me of my own parents and younger siblings. I hope that I'll be able to visit them soon, but I won't be able to if I can't earn coin. Days 21 to 24 Christopher and I found work delivering supplies to those victims of the illnesses being housed in the warehouses by the docks, and by God, I wish I hadn't taken the job. Nobody knows much of what's going on. City officials are very quiet on what exactly is happening, and the people grow restless. I discovered why they're keeping so silent while delivering bread and soup to the hungry victims of this mysterious illness. Before being let into the warehouse, I was given several clean rags dampened with olive oil, which I was told to wrap around my head so it covered my nose and mouth, and I was warned to breathe only through my rags. What I saw inside terrifies me still. The pitiful men and women were covered in large boils, many of which burst, leaking foul-smelling pus onto the bedsheets. Those were the lucky ones. Those whom the disease was ravaging the worst had fingers, toes, and even entire limbs green and black from gangrene. One man had an entire hand blackened with the foul disease, and I've been told that limbs are known to simply fall off from rot. I rushed to a corner of the cramped warehouse and vomited, removing my oil-dampened face covering. One of the good sisters, an elderly nun by the name of Sister Katerina, comforted me as I replaced my protective coverings. I don't know what this evil is, but it consumes men from the inside and blackens their very limbs. Only a disease from Satan himself could do something so foul. Days 25 to 28 The city's been officially quarantined. Church services are cancelled indefinitely and street performers and charlatans banned from city centers. Travel across the Rialto Bridge has been suspended, effectively cutting the city in half. Ferries across the Grand Canal and to the mainland are now barred from operating. We are a city cut in two, with each half cut off not just from each other but the rest of the world. The wealthy, however, seem exempt from these restrictions and every day they board small vessels to make the trip to the mainland, away from the crowded city. The city suddenly feels crowded and stuffy, despite the authorities banning travel except for one hour a day. There's rumors that that will soon end as well. Christopher and I are exempt from these restrictions by the nature of our work. Someone must care for the sick after all, but I admit, though I know ours is good moral work, I am afraid. I don't want to be anywhere near those warehouses anymore. At least the city has increased our pay and incentive to continue doing our necessary work. I'm earning more than I did at the docks, but I wish that I could just quit. Johannes hasn't asked us for any money, except a bit to help cover food expenses, and has so far refused us giving him any form of rent. Claiming hospitality is his Christian duty. He's a good man, and I'm glad to have him and his family in these dark times. Days 29 to 33 I've come to know Sister Katerina quite well in the last week. She's a good woman, and when I confide in her that I'm afraid to do my work because of the disease, she gently nods and pats my hand. It's natural to be afraid, she says, but we must share the love of Christ with these unfortunate souls even despite our fear, and we do so by feeding and caring for them. She's right, of course, but I am still afraid. Each day the number of victims in the warehouses grow. Several are now full to the brim, and more warehouses are being commandeered by the city for use as makeshift hospitals. The situation is increasingly grim, and I can't help but wonder if soon the entire city won't find itself in one of these sprawling warehouses. Eventually though, room does become available, albeit for very macabre reasons. Not many are surviving this foul disease. As their bodies become covered in large pustules, their extremities blacken and then die. Soon, too does the spirit within them die. On average, it only takes eight days, but for some, they last two weeks. Of every ten men who enter the warehouse as patients, only two will recover. Days 34 through 36 Christophero has a plan to leave the city. He is too afraid, and no amount of coin is enough for him to want to stay anymore. I try to tell him that the illness is temporary. Soon it'll pass and we'll get back to work and be back on the road to our dreams, but he doesn't listen. He wants to steal a boat and row us to the mainland. I tell him he's crazy, he'll be discovered and imprisoned, maybe even killed, for not just the theft of the boat but for violating the quarantine order. But he is undeterred, he wants to go back home to our remote village far away from this evil sickness. It's hard to argue with him because deep down inside, so do I. I try and keep my mind off of our troubles with my drawings. I like to draw the colorful songbirds, but lately they've been harder and harder to spot in the city. 
Venice has begun to reek from the smell of death, and the only birds that frequent the city now are crows and other scavengers. The pretty songbirds that once gave the city a charm unique to any other large European city are long gone, chased away by the putrescence that permeates the very air we breathe. Days 37 through 41. Johannes' wife Isabella has become ill, discovery that I made with great dread. She's been coughing, keeping it a secret from the rest of us, and insisting on remaining distant from the family and us. At first, we all assumed it was a passing foul mood. It seems we're all dealing with our own depressive spirits lately, but the steadily increasing coughing betrayed her illness. Often armed guards have to enforce the quarantine of the sick, but she surrendered herself to the makeshift hospitals at the dock voluntarily. Now I bring her food as I bring the rest of the ill, along with news from home. When I leave, I make sure to do all of my crying in private on the street so that Johannes and the children do not see my tear-streaked face. Instead, I smile as I return home, relaying messages and greetings from his wife for the family. Days 42 through 45. A mob of men attempted to rush the Rialto Bridge and cross it by force, only to be repelled by the armed guards. A number of them were killed, along with one or two of the guards. The city is a powder keg, and the quarantine has been tightened in response, only making tensions worse. The truth is, though, that other than a small number of discontents, most people are simply too afraid to leave their homes. Cristoforo is more insistent than ever that we leave, but it's not just fear of being discovered that keeps me here, but now a sense of duty as well. I'm the only link between Johannes and his wife, and with the incredible hospitality he's shown us, the thought of leaving him now is unbearable. The bad news, though, continues to grow. One of the children now has a telltale cough and has been removed from its sibling. We are all hopeful it's only a normal cold, but everyone knows the odds are slim to none. Days 46 through 50. I've been forced to bring Isabella her youngest son, who is now confirmed to have this terrible plague. She herself is faring best as can be hoped, with large pustules covering her inner thighs and armpits. I can tell the pain is unbearable, but she always has the sweetest smile for me. Her son is faring poorly. He is so young, barely more than three years old. Regardless, she's greeted him with her usual beaming smile and has not once dropped it since his arrival. In this place of sickness and misery, Isabella truly shines like a radiant dawn. I pray every day that she can recover, and though she seems to not be falling as severely ill as the others, I know there is little hope for her now. Sister Katerina has taken an immediate liking to Isabella and the young boy. I knew she would. Both women are bright spots in an increasingly evil world. I pray that their light not be extinguished. Days 51 and 52 the boy passed just two days after arrival at the warehouse, and now Johannes' second son is exhibiting symptoms. It's like a cruel joke. No sooner than one passes than the older boy falls ill and is delivered to his grieving mother's arms. For her part, though, Isabella remains as joyful as ever, though I can tell in my visits that her soul is absolutely crushed. She sheds her tears in private, though, like me and Sister Katerina, keeping a brave face for those who need us. I pray God spare her and Johannes the loss of yet another son. I pray that he spare us all from this horrible disease. Isabella seems unusually healthy despite being so stricken, and I'm hopeful that she'll be one of those that recover. She's already defied the odds for almost two weeks. Days 53 to 56. Many of the sisters that tend to the ill have fallen sick and died themselves, and yet more continue to take their place. I am in awe at the incredible courage of these women, serving the Lord despite knowing it'll likely mean death. I am reminded of tales of the great martyrs clinging to their faith despite torture, imprisonment, and death. I hope history remembers these brave women of faith. Christopher and I do our grim duty with great care, wishing to protect ourselves from this disease. Our olive oil rags protect us from breathing in the foul vapors, and rose oil protects the skin. It's a pricey commodity, but provided to us by the city for our duty. The pleasant smell of the oils helps combat this foulness, and I've been sneaking it to Isabella for her own use. I hate to admit, but she is looking weaker now. Thankfully, the foul blackness hasn't claimed any of her limbs, but she's no longer able to hide from her son or from us how very ill she's fallen. Despite this, she puts on a brave face for us all and musters the energy to play with her son with the few toys we've been allowed to bring to her from home. Days 57 and 58 Isabella and her son both died within a day of each other. The grief is overwhelming, and I was unable to hide my tears as I returned with the news for Johannes. It's a mercy, I suppose, that they died so soon after the other, sparing both the pain lingering of their own misery. Johannes, however, has been spared no misery. His cherished family is now all gone, and within hours of breaking the news to him, he too began to exhibit a cough. He did not hesitate and simply left the home to turn himself into the warehouses. It's as if he'd been battling the illness that took one son, buoyed by the hope of his wife and older son surviving, and now that they're gone, he simply surrendered himself to the disease. Days 59-62 to 62. 
Johannes requested that I bring him ink and paper as well as the presence of an official notary who met with us by standing a great distance from the open door of the warehouse. He has officially willed Cristoforo and I his home and remaining belongings. It's obvious to all that he has given up on his life. I asked him to please reconsider, telling him of the men and women I've seen leave these foul docks, healthy and hale. But he simply shrugged it off. I know by now the dangers of giving up. Those are the first to fall to the disease as it feasts on their weakened souls. But I suppose I can't blame him. Days 63 through 68. Johannes is now gone too, seemingly speeding to his own death in direct inverse proportion to the incredible fortitude and endurance of his beautiful wife. Christopher and I are now alone in the city, though our property owners, a feat that would have taken decades or more for our hard work and sacrifice to achieve, but it is a gift that tastes of ash, earned in the most horrible of circumstances. More of the nuns have died in their sacred duty tending to the needy, but Sister Katerina remains hale and healthy. I tell her it's incredible faith and purity of spirit that protects her, but she was quick to reprimand me. The other sisters had faith no lesser than her own, and as for her purity, I was shocked to hear her confess that she was once a prostitute. The disease is no more God's wrath than it is faith and purity that protects her from it, and she gently scolds me for my superstition. What then is this great evil that's fallen on the world, and why does it take good people like Isabella, I ask her. She chides me in her kindly way and asks me if I remember a great pain from my childhood. Yes, I tell her once when I was young. I teased the old goat my father kept and it rammed me in the chest in response. It hurt a great deal, but now the pain is simply a memory. I no longer feel it and no longer affects me. Likewise, Sister Katerina says it's the pain of this life in the light of eternity. We are in an imperfect world, and it's our character instructed in wisdom and temperance by the challenges of this life that survives to be rewarded in eternity. I don't know if Sister Katerina is right, but I know that I wish more Christians thought and acted like her. Days 69 through 73. Cristoforo has the cough. I suppose we both knew it was inevitable given our proximity to the ill. We both have wanted to quit our job bringing food and water to the sick, but we were shamed by Sister Katerina's powerful example. Even Cristoforo had quit his talk of leaving the city. If the good sister had the courage to remain and serve the sick, how could we possibly do less? I bring him drawings of pretty birds to cheer him up, but they are drawings I have to make from memory, as no songbird had visited the city in months. In their place, the carrion birds have grown in number, feasting on the remains of the dead that are piled outside the harbor like cordwood, waiting to be burned. With only special shipments from the mainland to the city arriving once a week, there's simply not enough firewood to burn the corpses faster than they accumulate, and the stink has grown to incredible proportions. It affects the poor forced to live near the docks the worst, but drifts even to the more affluent neighborhoods in the city. Days 74 through 78. I received a letter from home. First since my arrival, it's difficult to communicate given the remoteness of the village and the messengers only pass by rarely. With the quarantine, my letter had to await the monthly special shipment to arrive on the mainland and make its way to my family. I am relieved to hear that all is well back at home, though it is clear the letter is weeks old. They've heard of the illness back home and inquire to my health, expressing great concern. I write back and pay the fee to send my response with next week's shipment, but I don't have the heart to tell them that Cristoforo has fallen ill. I also don't tell of Johannes and his family. The less they know back home, the better. I'm relieved, however, to discover that there is no sign of this plague amongst them. The village is remote, and it seems to be the large cities and surrounding countryside that's most severely affected. By now, it is clear that ships traveling from Asia have brought the disease with them and spread it from port to port across Europe and North Africa. The remoteness of my home village, which I once resented due to my ambitions of becoming a great artist, is now a blessing I am most grateful for. Days 79 through 83. Cristoforo is severely ill. There are large pustules growing along his inner thighs and arms. The gangrenous rot has claimed his toes, and it works his way up his feet. His fingertips also show sign of rot. Neither of us mention it, but we have both worked these warehouses long enough to know that those who display the rot rarely ever survive. Instead, we talk about our plans for after the illness. As property owners, we are entitled to more rights than others. Real opportunities await us. We decide that it'd be best to sell the home and use the proceeds to invest in one of the smaller trade ships. With so many sailors dying to the disease and trade grinding to a halt, once the ports reopen, there will be fortunes to be made. Our investment in even a smaller trade galley is bound to yield incredible returns. Then I'll be able to attend one of the fine art academies I've hoped for and move my family to the city. Cristoforo will be able to afford the fancy hats and fine shoes he's always dreamed of owning. He'll look just like the nobles he's always looked up to. Wealthy farmers will line up outside our door to offer us their beautiful daughters in marriage once we're successful businessmen and artists. Such a pleasant fantasy that as I tell the stories of our bright future, I don't even notice when Cristoforo closes his eyes for the last time. 
with a small smile still on his disease-stricken face. Days 84 to 89. All I have left in the city is Sister Katarina, but it seems that she too will soon leave me. After months of working closely with the men and women so sick even the other nuns were afraid of, the good sister is now showing signs of the deadly infection. She doesn't have to turn herself into the quarantine as she's been living here amongst the ill since the plague began. That way she could more readily attend to their needs, she explained. I find myself filled with dark thoughts and understand better than ever Johanna's choice. I wonder aloud if the disease will soon claim me too, but the sister scolds me for such thinking. Instead, she asks me to show her drawings and talk about my future plans. I tell her about selling the home. I could never stay in a place of such sorrow and of all my plans to invest in one of the trading ventures once the ports reopen. She nods in approval but makes me promise to do my Christian duty and tithe 10% of everything I earn. I smile at her and promise to do as she wishes. I tell her about Cristoforo's plan to sneak out of the city and to my surprise she agrees. Do it, she says, leave this place of death. She's rather insistent on the matter. I'm shocked to my core to even hear the good sister encourage me to steal a boat and flee the city, but I couldn't leave her if I even wanted to. Finally, she confides to me that she doesn't want to see me fall ill, but she also doesn't want me to see her pass as I have seen others go. Leave before that, she begs me. I am disturbed, but I understand. I tell her I will heavily consider it. Days 90 to 92. I can't help but notice that the number of guards has dropped dramatically since the plague began. Many of them have fallen ill. I know, as I've personally seen them condemned to the warehouses. It's more difficult to properly enforce the quarantine, and I've seen enough missing boats to know that others have acted on their own plans for escape. What guards do remain largely concentrated on the canal crossings, keeping the city split in two, separated from itself. I tell Sister Katarina and she smiles. She asks me to leave her some of my bird drawings before I go. They cheer her up and remind her of more pleasant times. I give her a stack of my drawings and remind her that I have not agreed to go. She smiles again in her knowing way. As I leave to go home, I realize she's right. I will be leaving the city. I don't think I can bear to see Sister Katarina die any more than she can bear the thought of me watching her go. Days 93 to 95. It takes time to prepare for my escape from the city. I stash supplies and take the long route from the kitchens to the warehouses, which gives me an opportunity to take inventory of the small tied up rowboats along my travel route. I mentally pick one out. I feel a small amount of shame knowing I'll be committing theft against its owner, but odds are the owner's dead anyway. The thought is only slightly comforting. I tell Sister Katarina the news and she smiles broadly. She isn't looking very well. The rot hasn't come for her yet, but the large pustules have grown along her arms and chest. I'm grateful. If she dies, at least let her die unblemished by the foul, stinking rot that claims the others. Let her die with a body of dignity, like Isabella. I ask God for this small mercy. I bring Sister Katarina drawings of my home, where I plan on returning to. I want her to picture the world beyond the walls of this overcrowded, foul-smelling warehouse. I even buy colored pencils so I can draw the green grass, the warm yellow sun. Those aren't cheap and eat a sizable amount of my savings, but their price increased dramatically by the quarantine, but it's well worth it to see the smile on the good sister's face. I only keep one drawing from her, a portrait I secretly made as she slept. That one will be for myself, a way to remember Sister Katarina after she's passed. Finally, I bid her goodbye for the last time, fighting the tears back and putting on a brave face. Then, I surprise myself by throwing my arms around her as gently as I can so as not to aggravate her painful pustules. She is shocked and briefly returns the embrace before pushing me away, but I don't care about this damn disease anymore. Then I leave, but I can only hold the tears in long enough to turn my back on the sister. I don't bother hiding them as I exit the warehouse. It's okay, nobody pays any attention to you anymore if you weep. This entire city has been flooded by tears. Days 96 and 97. I don't show up to work as I'll have to prepare for my escape from the city. I take the time to scout the route I plan on taking to the boat I've picked out and do my best to learn the patterns of the patrolling guards. The patrols are scarce though and the lockdown within the city is only enforced sparingly. There's simply not enough manpower left to keep everyone inside by force. Yet the streets remain largely empty, everyone quarantining inside their homes by choice, terrified of venturing beyond and falling prey to the disease. Days 98 and 99. I make my escape at night. Reaching my selected boat is easy enough. There are ships out in the lagoon, but I doubt anyone's paying particular attention. Of more concern will be anyone on the mainland, who may be none too happy about another fleeing rat from the sinking city of Venice. The current is surprisingly strong, and it takes me hours to land on that distant shore. Once there, I make my way inland with a few belongings and my small savings. I opt to sleep in the wilderness, however, knowing that the arrival of a stranger to one of the local villages will alert the authorities. To my surprise, there are armed patrols along the roads, some official and other local militias protecting their villages from anyone who might be bringing the disease with them. I've heard rumors that the plague has struck the mainland and penetrated deep, but I didn't realize things were as bad as here in Venice. 
I decide to hunker down for a day and move at night. My plan is simple. I will travel at night and take the wild paths all the way home. I'm a fairly good navigator and I should be able to reach home within a week. Day 100. I'm awakened by a sharp poke in the rib from a homemade pike. The boy holding it must be just a few years younger than I, and he looks nervous. As I rise, he threatens me with the makeshift pike, commanding me to keep my distance and stay where I am. Soon, his shouts alert the rest of his group and several older men rush to us. They are all similarly armed. They are clearly local militia from one of the nearby villages, and they eye me with great suspicion. Then the eldest amongst them steps forward. You're from the city, aren't you? You shouldn't have come here. You should have stayed and died with the rest instead of bringing your disease to our homes. The man brandishes his sharpened pitchfork, aiming it directly at my heart. Now go watch I Survived 100 Days of Nuclear War, or click this other video instead.